Um, as we, you know, we're about the midpoint of the semester now. I hope you're all safe, uh, doing well in these difficult times. And I hope you're adapting to the way this and your other classes are going. Um, today we're going to talk about a paper. Um, one of the authors is Anna Louise Reisenbach. And this is a name you'll become more familiar with um, as we go into the next part of this class. Um, and we'll talk about a couple of our other papers, which um, were kind of the predecessors of this paper. So let's get started. The paper today is uh, Genomics Informed Isolation and Characterization of a Symbiotic Nanoarchaeota System from a Terrestrial Geothermal Environment. And you should probably have this printed out or, or something so that you can review this as we go through the slideshow. What your task is going to be for this discussion session isn't going to be so much about the paper itself, but thinking about the paper, uh, what they talk about, what they describe, what's the background that you need to know as a reader in order for this paper to have meaning. Um, spill this out in a paragraph or two and post it on the discussion page. And of course, as usual, come back over the weekend and add a couple of comments. Um, I'm going to clarify a little bit. We're not, in terms of what the reader needs to know, um, not what the needer, reader needs to know to understand any microbiological paper, but what the reader needs to know to understand this specific paper. So the purpose of this paper, the author set out to co-cultivate uh, this new example of a host symbiont pair on the basis of, of a previous single-cell genome sequencing and, and predict the nutritional, uh, in which they predict the nutritional requirements of both organisms. So in terms of background, Nanoarchaeum equitans um, was the first and before this paper only um, archaeal parasite that had been isolated. It was isolated by accident in 2002. Um, they appeared as blebs in an ignococcus culture isolated from the Colban Sea Ridge off the coast of Iceland. This EM picture here shows that the large um, normal archaeal looking cell is ignococcus. Uh, you can even see the nucleoid separated from the, the cytoplasm. And the two blebs on the lower right are uh, the, the symbiont or parasite nanoarchaeum equitans. Ignococcus grows between 70 and 100 degrees centigrade and it's an autotroph. It grows by sulfur reduction using hydrogen as the reductant to make hydrogen sulfide and it fixes CO2. Um, nanoarchaeum was the first and again before this paper the only known archaeal parasite. Um, it's one of the smallest known cellular organisms uh, at about 300 nanometers in diameter um, with the smallest genome known. Uh, it only had 540 protein encoding genes. And if you look at what these genes are for, almost all of them are for uh, what you might call the central information processing of the cell. That is DNA replication, transcription, translation. Um, it's an obligate extracellular parasite or symbiont, if you wish, um, and it relies on its host for all the metabolism, and it's probably ATP as well. It's probably not just a parasite in terms of nutrients, but it's probably also an energy parasite. Now, this was the only cultivated member of the nanoarchaeum, where it was discovered, but since then, uh, related organisms, both the host and the parasites, have been detected in hydrothermal environments all over the world, but none were successfully cultivated. And so prior to the paper uh, discussion, um, what Anna Louise did was to isolate picking a single cell out of a um, out of obsidian pool and sequence their genomes without cultivation. And then they use this genome sequence information to predict the metabolic requirements of that host symbiont pair and use that information to cultivate 
a similar set of organisms from a different spring. And so what they did was they, so once they designed the culture media based on, on, the, on, on the predicted nutritional requirements, um, they did what they called dilution to extinction. This is a commonly used method for isolating hard to grow organisms. You basically dilute them until you have on average only one cell per mill for inoculum. Um, you do this for inoculation so that most of the cultures have only are only inoculated with one cell and so don't have to compete with anything else. And then they used optical tweezers to fish out a single host, single parasite system out of the enrichment cultures and, um, and grew that up. So this is obsidian pool. You've seen this picture before. This is where the genome sequence from single organisms came from. So they took, this, they took samples of this pool, were able to fish out a single apparent host symbiont pair um, under a microscope, fish that out, and sequence their genomes. Um, NST1 is the genome sequence of the parasite, and ACD1 is the genome of its host. This is cistern spring. This is from the paper under discussion today. Um, it's a mildly acidic hot spring. It's in the Norse Geyser Basin. Um, and and in, in metagenomics analysis, they knew that this spring was very rich in nanoarchaeal-like sequences. And so they decided to use that for inoculum for their enrichment cultures. All right, so let's, let's jump into the paper itself, and I'm going to zoom in. Here's the abstract. Biological features can be inferred based on genomic data from many microbial lineages that remain uncultured. However, cultivation is important for characterizing an organism's physiology and testing its genome-encoded potential. Here we use single-cell genomics to infer cultivation conditions for the isolation of an ectosymbiotic nanoarchaeote um, and they named this organism Nanopacillus acidilobi, and its host, an acidilobus, uh, which is a crinarchio, um, from a terrestrial geothermal environment. The cells of Nanopacillus are among the smallest known cellular organisms, 100 to 300 nanometers. They appear to have a complete genetic information processing machinery, but lack almost all primary biosynthetic functions, as well as respiration and ATP synthesis. They don't say it here, but it does have some sugar metabolism, which we'll get back to. Genomic and proteomic comparison with its distant relative, the marine nanoarchaeum equitans, illustrate an ancient common evolutionary history of adaptation of the nanoarchaeota to ectosymbiosis, so far unique amongst archaea. And so a lot of what this paper is about is comparing this, this organism in terms of its culture and its conditions and how it behaves and its genome to that of nanoarchaeum equitans. This is the background of the paper shown here, and I'm not going to review this because this is really the focus of what you guys need to do as part of this discussion session. But it starts out in the first paragraph talking about the importance of both culture-dependent and culture-independent approaches to microbiology talks a little bit about, in the second paragraph, about nanoarchaeum equitans and about their previous genome sequencing of NST1 and ACD1. And then in the last paragraph talks about uh, why this new information is important in terms of the uh, evolutionary history of the organisms and reductive evolution by parasites. And in the last bit of the introduction, they state the actual purpose of the paper, um, which is to describe, uh, here we use single cell genomics to infer physiological dependencies and adaptation to low pH environments for the isolation and characterization of the first terrestrial nanoarchaeota host system from an acidic hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. And again, their enrichment was based on metagenomics, that is, the, these previously determined um, genome sequences from a single host parasite pair of cells from obsidian pool. They used 
uh, environmental sequencing. So here it says we're using small subunit gene amplification, that is the isolated DNA from cistern spring, um, amplified ribosomal RNA and sequenced it and found that 7% of all the archaeal sequences in that spring were of nanoarchaea. Um, this is much, much higher than any other environment. And so this is why they used it as the, the inoculum. They inferred from the genome sequences of NST1 and ACD1 um, that these organisms were, were not going to be autotrophs like uh, the, the previous one, um, but that the host was going to be a, a heterotroph, uh, something that would use uh, uh, peptides or complex sugars like starch and, and so forth, glycogen. And so they, they used an enrichment media for this purpose. Um, that is, they, they supplemented their media. Bronch media is a standard media for quinarchaea, contains uh, a variety of minerals and phosphorus and so forth. And they added yeast extract because they weren't sure if, this or, if the hosts could make all the vitamins and things that they would need, cofactors. And they added case amino acids, which is a hydrolysate of, of, of casein, um, a milk protein, um, and either sucrose or glycogen, com a complex sugar, and incubated them at 80 to 85 degrees um, at about pH 3 or 3.5. And, and they were able to get cultures. Nanoarchaea were microscopically observed using DAPI. This is a stain that binds to DNA. And they could see in their enrichment cultures, shown here, so, for example, this is one right there, where you have a, a cell in the middle. That, the actual cell is much larger than this. DNA only stains the, primarily stains the nucleoid. Um, these organisms have well-organized nucleoids. Um, the, the cytoplasm of the cell isn't, visual, isn't visible. And then you see three blebs off to the side with a really intense um, focus of, of DAPI staining. That's the nucleoid of the parasite. And so they believe that they had a nice enrichment culture of the host symbiosis. They were able then to use a dilution to extinction again and optical tweezers. Optical tweezers are, are, are a method we'll talk about a little later, but it allows you to pluck a single cell or cell complex out of, of an enrichment culture and, and inoculate it into uh, fresh media so that what you have is a, is a pure culture, but you never had to isolate colonies on a plate. Their enrichment cultures were rich in acidolobus. Um, and again, this is where they described using uh, dilution to extinction and optical tweezers, and they were able to get it to grow. This is what this culture looks like when probed in a couple of interesting different ways. And so here, the, there, there's a, a ribosomal stain that is a, 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 an oligonucleotide fluorescently tagged that targets specifically the acetylobus ribosomal RNA. This will uh, bind to all the ribosomes in the cell and essentially paint the cells of acetylobus only red. And then you have a second ribosomal stain, if you will, that is uh, against nanopacillus. And so this, again, is an oligonucleotide probe tagged with a green fluorescent probe. And that's hybridized. And this paints the nanopacillus cells green. And so here you can very easily see the host parasite system stuck together. In this culture, you also see individual cells of acidolobus without any parasites. And you even see some of the parasites without any hosts. That's an important point that we'll get back to. And some of the hosts contain you know, only one parasite. Some can contain two, three, four, or more. This is a scanning EM of, the, of this culture. And you can see the, um, the disc-shaped acidolobus. 
th these are pretty badly distorted by the electron microscopic uh, drying process. Um, and the parasite itself, nanopacillus. And if you, if you measure these, what you see is that the cells um, vary in size from um, 100 to 200 nanometers in diameter. Up in the top right, you see that these things really are firmly attached. Um, during the drying stage, these two cells were stuck down and then desiccated, and you can see the, the, the stretched out attachment between them. This cell range, 0.1 to 0.3 microns, uh, makes this organism perhaps the smallest known cellular organism. Well, who are these organisms? Um, and so this is a phylogenetic tree, uh, uh, generally of the Crenarchaea. Um, the Uriarchaea at the bottom serve as the outgroup. And then all these organisms that we've been talking about are included. If we can zoom in a bit. In blue, at the top we have Ignococcus hospitalis. This is the host of the original, um, originally isolated um, host symbiont pair. And blue near the bottom is Nanoarchaeum equitans. So these are the ones that were isolated almost 20 years ago now um, as host uh, symbiont, uh, as a host symbiont pair. In green, you have NST1 and ACD1. These are the two sequences of host ACD1 and parasite NST1 um, that were physically isolated but not cultivated from obsidian pool. And it was, it was these genome sequences that, that determined the, con, uh, the cultivation conditions under which the organisms in red were isolated from cistern spring. And those organisms in red, of course, are Nanopacillus acidilobi the uh, parasite, and Acidoloba species 7a, the host. Now what's interesting about this is that they set out to isolate the NST1, ACD1 host symbiont pair or something closely related. If you look at this tree, they were successful in terms of isolating a close relative of the parasite, NST1 and nanopacillus are closely related on the tree. But they did not get the same host. And so ACD1, look at that, look at that in the phylogenetic tree, is clearly a species of sulfalobus. Whereas the host that they obtained was fairly distantly related and, and um, a species of acidolobus. An important question that came up with the original nanoarchaeum was that nanoarchaeum is clearly a parasite. Infection uh, of its host, uh, Ignococcus, by nanoarchaeum slows the growth of, of, of the host parasite pair. Um, in, in this case, the authors argue that this doesn't happen, that if you look at this graph, um, in blue, it's acidolobus, the same strain growing alone. And in red, circles are, is acidolobus in a co-culture, and red squares is the nanopacillus. Um, you can see um, that, that, at least in terms of the maximum amount of growth after f about four days, there's no difference between the acidolobus grown alone or with the parasite. Um, I have to disagree a little bit with the authors um, however, that the parasite doesn't inhibit the growth. If you look at the, at the slope of the lines from inoculation up to day two, um, it looks pretty clear to me that the growth rate, that is the slope of that line, is lower for the co-culture than it is for the host alone. And so uh, I'd like to see better data on this, but it looks to me like this, this parasite may be slowing the growth. Um, of its host, and so it will qualify as a real parasite, not the more general term symbiont. Um, the authors argue that it may be because of sugar metabolism in, in the parasite um, that it may be contributing something to, to their co-culture. Um, we'll, we'll see about that.
A really interesting thing about the genome sequence, both of NST1 and Nanopacillus, um, is that those genomes contain the genes for flagella. Now, archaea have flagella. Uh, these flagella are structurally and functionally similar to the flagella of bacteria, although it's absolutely clear that they have an independent origin. Uh, flagella motors are based on secretion systems, and archaeal flagella and bacterial flagella are based on fundamentally different uh, protein secretion complexes. Um, archaea flagella are not driven by the proton motor force, but are driven directly by ATP hydrolysis, for example. Archaea flagella are not hollow um, and are not built up uh, at the tip, but are solid and are built at the base. Um, and, and so anyway, it looks like these, these two nanoarchaea um, ought to be able to make flagella. And flagella, of course, are used for motility. Uh, why would an obligate surface parasite have flagella? The other interesting thing is, remember that we occasionally saw nanopacillus growing alone, or at least existing alone, in the cultures with acetylobus. Um, thirdly, remember that the nanopacillus isolated from cistern spring was associated with an acetylobus host, whereas the nanopacillus genome sequence fished out of obsidian pool was associated with a sulfalobus sequence. All of these things suggest that nanopacillus ought to be able to switch hosts. That is, it ought to be able to detach, float around, and stick to a new host. Um, and this makes sense for a parasite, right? If your host is in bad shape, um, if it's if you detect that it's going into SOS response or some kind of stress response, um, you may want to be the rat abandoning the ship, um, detach, float around, and hope to find a healthy host that you can attach to. The authors, however, were unable to detect this process. And so this is a complicated image here. There, there are three stains going on that, that are all kind of very different. The blue, stone, the blue stain is DAPI. This is staining the nucleoids of the cells we're looking at. The red stain is a ribosomal probe against acetylobus. And so, that is specifically, excuse me, about acetylobus nanophyllum, that is the, the normal host for nanopacillus. And the green stain is a, is a ribosomal probe against nanopacillus. And so green labels nanopacillus, um, blue labels acetylobus of any kind, um, and the nucleoids, and red shows the cytoplasm of nanopacillus nanophyllum, the normal host of nanopacillus. And so nan acetylobus nanopacillus shows up as a blue nucleoid with the, surrounded by a red cytoplasm, whereas acetylobus uh, saccharovorans shows up just as the nucleoid and you don't see the cytoplasm. Well, what they've done here is, is they've taken a culture of nanopacillus and, and acetylobus nanophyllum, and they've added acetylobus saccharovor saccharovorans, um, a closely related acetylobus, and cultivated them together for an extended period of time. And what they're looking for is nanopacillus attached to acetylobus saccharovorans instead. So they're looking to see if they could detect nanopacillus switching hosts, and they were unable to do that. Never did they observe nanopacillus attached to a saccharovorans. Um, despite the fact, once again, that this, this nanopacillus has uh, apparently the ability to have flagella, um, and, and there's uh, uh, the other, other evidence for host switching. They don't, they don't see that here. I will point out that although the organism has the genes for, for flagella, if we go back a moment at the EM, there's no evidence in these pictures of flagella uh, in nanopacillus. So they, they have the genes, but at least under the conditions shown here, they weren't expressing them. Speaking of genes, uh, the authors then create um, kind of a map of these two organisms based on their genome complements. It's kind of a wiring diagram of the metabolism of these cells. And you ought to get used to seeing those. You'll be seeing them a lot. Um, 
not just in this class, but, but in, in others and, and in the future. This is an important aspect of how people visualize genome data. At the bottom is the host, the acetylobus, and, and this genome looks like a standard issue heterotrophic um, crinarchaeote. Um, this particular one is clearly subsisting on, on polysaccharides and peptides. You see the genes for, for peptide hydrolysis and import of amino acids. You see the genes for, for polysaccharide hydrolysis, things like amylases and glucosidases, and the import of, of um, oligo and, and monosaccharides. It's got a normal set of electron transport, so complex one, ATPases, import pumps. It, it, it has the, the genes for um, uh, oxygen reduction by electron transport. Um, this organism can grow by aerobic respiration and also the genes for uh, sulfur reduction. And so there's nothing unusual there. Um, in the parasite, you see all the genes for central, pro central information processing. Um, you don't see electron transport chain. Um, this organism is importing um, nutrients from its host, and so it needs a proton motive force. doesn't have electron transport, but it does have um, an ATP-driven proton pump. Basically, ATPase run in reverse. And so it hydrolyzes ATP, pumps protons to generate a proton motive force, and it's using this energy to drive um, import of nutrients from the host. It's got the genes for an S layer and the genes for secreting this S layer into the mem into, through the membrane. Um, it does have a couple of, of, of import pumps on the surface. Um, Interestingly, the one set of metabolism that it retains that, that nanoarchaeum doesn't is a set of genes for sugar metabolism. This was also found in the genome of NST1. And so you can you see this shown here. It's, it's got uh, the genes for uh, the inner deuteron pathway um, or glycolysis, um, and it, it can make glycogen. The, the authors argue this may be a way for the host or for the parasite to contribute something to this host parasite relationship. It's also possible, however, that, that the sugar metabolism is retained only for the purpose of glycosylation of its surface membrane proteins. Uh, and again, it, it retains the genes for the um, archaeal flagellum um, and, and the motor complex. So, once again, your task is to think, is to read this paper, make some sense of it, and then ask yourself, well, what does a reader need to know before this paper makes sense or has meaning? Um, spill this out in a paragraph or two and post it on the discussions page, and then come back over the weekend and, and, and comment on your own or other people's um, uh, posts about this background or context. And again, I'll reiterate, I, I'm not asking for the background you need to understand any microbiological paper, but the background and context needed to understand this specific paper. And so, for example, last year when we did this, I, I got some comments along the lines of, well, you know, need to know how enrichment cultures work or how, how genome sequencing works or, um, oh, let me see, how recombinant DNA technology works. Um, you need to know about transcription and translation. All of those things are true, but those are the things that those aren't the things you need to know about to understand this specific paper as opposed to any other microbiology paper. And, and, and the introduction in the paper itself is probably a good place to start. All right. So uh, once again, I hope you guys are all staying safe and well. And I look forward to seeing uh, your discussion over the weekend. Thanks.